So the last lecture for today and the first lecture by Professor Yom Bai Kim from University of Toronto. He'll be talking about correlations and topology and quantum materials. And we'll continue. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a very general title here today. And that was mainly because um, I didn't know what I wanted to talk about. So if I give a very general title, then basically I can decide later what I want to talk about. So, but I sort of decide today. OK, so uh, uh, in the last uh, four lectures or so, um, you learned how powerful the Landau theory is. Uh, the topic of my talk today uh, is to tell you that actually there are situations where the Landau theory is not very useful. And the question is then, what can you do about it? So this is the topic of topological phases of interacting electrons in you know, quantum materials. So uh, roughly, my outline looks like this. So I'm going to give you a very general introduction to uh, topological phases of matter. So there are several different definitions of this. So I'd like to uh, just give you some uh, a, a quick overview of this uh, idea of topological phases of matter. Then I'm going to use uh, quantum material with a strong spin orbit coupling as a, flat, uh, as a platform to discover some of these topological phases that are discussed in the literature. And I have two uh, broad examples here. Uh, the first example is material called the paracolor iridate. And I'm going to tell you that uh, theoretically we expect to see a number of interesting topological phases of matter. Uh, then I will switch the gear and I will talk about uh, recent activities on quantum spin liquid and guitar materials. Uh, here, I, you know, I, I will mostly focus on theoretical ideas. Uh, later in the week, uh, on Wednesday, uh, Professor Hide Takagi will give you much more uh, uh, sort of broader perspective on quantum spin liquid phases in uh, uh, quantum material. And if I have time, I'd like to make a connection to uh, a so-called topological superconductivity. Okay, so, so topological phases is a new paradigm. So unlike the uh, Landau uh, theory that you, you, you heard about, this topological phase, phase is really only like 30 years old because really the beginning of the topological phase uh, is a quantum hole effect. So, uh, so we have, in condensed matter, we have more than one standard model, different from the high energy physics. And one of the standard models is this, this Landau theory that you heard about. Uh, essentially here, the Landau uh, 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 wanted to uh, classify possible broken symmetry phases of matter. And, and, and then you have to introduce this idea of order parameter. And one nice thing about this concept was that you can, in, you can actually measure this order parameter by experiment. So for example, if you use an X-ray, you can uh, 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 understand the crystal structure uh, basically by measuring the charge density modulation. If you use a neutron, you can measure the magnetic structure and by looking at a spin density modulation. And all these things like charge density modulation, spin density modulation, you can define an order parameter. In fact, you can define lambda order parameter for those objects. And that's the way that we classify different kinds of broken symmetry phases. So that's the way we classify uh, crystal structure, magnetic order, and even superconductivity. So that's essentially what you heard. Uh, in the last uh, four lectures. And there's another standard model that's called Landau form liquid theory for uh, intera interacting electrons in metal. And that's also proposed by Landau. So Landau at least proposed uh, two standard models that we use in everyday life. Okay. So now, if you want to go beyond the Landau paradigm, uh, then, then what is out there? And so one, one interesting concept is this topological phases of metal. And really, the beginning of uh, topological phase is the integer quantum whole state. So, uh, so you can think about this as a grandfather of topological insulator. So th this is basically the experimental setup that you are uh, already familiar with. So you, you take a piece of uh, two-dimensional electron system. Uh, then you apply a current. Then you measure the uh, longitudinal and the transverse voltage drop. And that way, you can uh, measure either 
uh, uh, the whole resistivity and longitudinal resistivity. Uh, then when you uh, look at, for example, uh, the sigma xy, the, 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 the orthogonal component of the conductivity tensor, and that's quantized in the units of uh, E square of H. So this is the famous quantization of whole conductivity of um, integer quantum whole state. And, and notice that when I change my magnetic field, uh, you basically go from uh, one kind of quantum whole state to another kind, kind of quantum whole state. And basically, there is no order parameter uh, related to any of those phases of matter. So basically, you cannot use the uh, uh, lambda order parameter to define such a phase. And this phase of matter has a very interesting property. So the bulk is capped. On the other hand, if you look at the boundary, then, then because of the fact that uh, 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 tiny universal symmetry is broken, essentially, the, 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 the electrons at the, at the boundary or the edge can only move in a one direction. So for example, at this boundary, the, the electron should move on the right-hand side this way, and the other guy should move the other way. So it, essentially, the motion of the edge state is chiral. And because of that, this chiral edge state cannot backscatter. And the, the interesting thing about this picture is that say, imagine that I'm starting from a usual parabolic band structure without a magnetic field. And we know that if I apply a magnet, uh, uh, orbital magnetic field, then I end up with a uh, uh, Landau level. So this is basically drawing uh, energy level as a function of uh, spatial coordinate here, it's not a momentum. So this represents the boundary of uh, the sample. This is the, this is the center of the sample. And in the, in the center of the sample, you have a bulk, usual bulk Landau level. But when you go to a, a, a boundary of the system, there's an edge confining potential. So your energy levels are all going up like this. And, and by doing so, you create an edge state. Essentially, your lambda level meets the uh, Fermi energy, and that's the way that you are creating a boundary state. And notice that if you create a boundary state like this, for example, those edge states are moving into the page of the view graph, and those edge states are coming out from the page of the view graph. So that way, you are basically physically separating right moving particles and left moving particles. So if you just focus on one boundary, then the boundary edge state uh, is essentially chiral. Of course, you have both right movers and left movers, but they are physically separated. So if you just focus on the boundary, uh, and, and, and then it becomes chiral. So what that means is that if you just focus on the boundary, and those guys cannot be realized in the standalone one d system. So in the usual one d system, of course, you have both uh, right movers and left movers. Here, you can separate them uh, physically. Okay, so, uh, so uh, people realize that uh, in order to characterize such phases of matter, you cannot use a lambda order parameter. You have to use something else. So, so imagine that I, I'm starting with a semi-classical dynamics of electrons. So this is what you find in Ashcroft moment. So basically, uh, the time derivative of uh, a momentum is a force. So it's given by the Lorentz force. Uh, the velocity is given by the, the K gradient of uh, uh, the band structure. So if you use the uh, block electron wave function uh, on, in the solid, and this is basically the semi-classical equation motion you discover uh, in your Ashcroft moment textbook. And we understand now that this equation motion is not complete, so you have to actually add additional uh, term here. And this additional term has, uh, has a, some similarity to this Lorentz force in the uh, real space. So you can think of that as a, a Lorentz force in the momentum space. Essentially, uh, this emergent magnetic field, if you like B, is coming, uh, given by the k-space curl of uh, uh, what we call a Berry gauge field. So this is just given by overlap of uh, k gradient of uh, uh, this part of the block wave function and sandwich that with the another bra state. So uh, this, this acts like a gauge field or the magnetic vector potential in momentum space, and that's the way that you can generate this, what people call a very, uh, a very magnetic field. And that acts like a, you know, effective magnetic field in k space. So you can think of that as a range force in k space. So it turns out, uh, if you do the uh, integral over entire brilliant zone uh, of, of, of uh, the magnetic, magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic field, then that gives me a net flux, uh, momentum space uh, a magnetic flux. 
And the, it turns out this number is uh, quantized uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, integer number. So that if you, if, you, if you sum up for all occupied state, then the total churn number of occupied state is an integer topological invariant. And one can show that this quantity is directly related to uh, the orthogonal matrix element of the whole uh, conductivity tensor. And that's the way that we are now understand why uh, sigma x, y is quantized uh, uh, in integer quantum world state. And notice that here, the center, central object is this topological invariant. Okay. So generally, if we think about a topological phase of matter, and this phase of matter cannot be characterized by some local order parameter, like a magnetization and magnet. Um, also, uh, another way to think about this phase is that if you, if you try to deform this phase adiabatically by using some kind of unitary transformation uh, lo or local perturbation, then you cannot go to, go to uh, say, simple phase, simple metals and band insulators, uh, just by doing simple operation. You have to go through the phase transition. And you have to, perhaps, many of these phases are characterized by some uh, topological properties or non-local properties. So uh, it, 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 it turns out that uh, there is a way to characterize these phases by thinking about phase transition between different phases of matter. So for, for simple discussion, let's focus on a gap phases of matter. What that means is that I'm thinking about phases where the, uh, there's a bulk gap. Uh, so imagine that I'm trying to connect uh, some arbitrary topological phase with the simple phases of matter. So what I mean by simple phases of matter is that these phases can be fully characterized by a lambda's local order parameter. And then, and then, then I'm trying to go from this phase to the other by uh, using, say, successive uh, local unitary transformation. So I'm, basically what I'm saying is that uh, you are changing your Hamiltonian adiabatically. Okay. So the claim is that you cannot go there uh, without closing the bulk gap. So in order, to have, in order to go to this kind of phase of matter, you have to close the gap somewhere and go through the phase transition, and only then you can reach the other phase. So that's one possible way to uh, characterize such a phase. And, and, and the examples of such a phase of matter are basically quantum whole state that I talked about, and also the quantum spin liquid uh, belongs to this category. And in this case, symmetry doesn't play any role. And that's why these type of topological phases are called intrinsic topological phases of matter. Okay. So uh, a lot of us learn about this quantum whole state either uh, uh, in graduate courses, or maybe in even undergraduate courses these days, uh, or you, at least you heard about this. So uh, I, I only told so, so far, I only told you about the integer quantum whole state, but there's a more interacting version of it. There's a fraction of quantum whole state. So, for example, when you fill out, say, one third of the lowest lambda level of two, two dimensional electron gas, so that's what I mean by nu equal one third, and you can form a correlated version of the quantum whole state. And, uh, you know, people are more familiar with the idea that, for example, when I measure uh, the orthogonal matrix, orthogonal or, or conductivity, then is quantized in terms of like some fractional number, like a one third. But, so, but you may not be familiar with the idea that if you actually put the system on a non-trivial manifold, like a torus instead of a sphere, then you can actually change the number of degenerate, number of ground state. For example, if you put this system on a torus, uh, then you can show that uh, uh, there are three degenerate ground state. If you put the system on a sphere, surface of the sphere, then there's, there's only one ground state. And, and obviously, ordinary phase of matter wouldn't do that, because if I have a piece of copper, and I put that on the surface of the torus, or the surface of the sphere, the ground state it must be unique. Okay. I mean, of course, you wouldn't do this experiment. This is like a Kedankian experiment. And in this case, if you go to the boundary, then that edge state is, again, a, a one-dimensional uh, chiral uh, uh, electron liquid, but in this case, uh, 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 different from the integer case, these electrons are strongly interacting each other, so it, they form a so-called Luttinger liquid. But you can think of that as uh, uh, strongly interacting one-dimensional electron gas moving, moving only in one direction. Also, such a phase uh, uh, also supports this so-called uh, non-trivial excitation, so the, it supports this 
a charge of one third, a lopen koja particle, that these are the elementary excitations. So these are the known facts. Okay. So and I'm not going to talk about quantum Hall effect, so I'd like to switch my gear and explain why quantum spin liquid phases may have similar properties like what the fractional quantum Hall state has. Okay. So, uh, so quantum spin liquid is another example of uh, intrinsic topological phase. So what do you mean by quantum spin liquid generally is that uh, we are talking about a quantum paramagnet. So essentially, if you, if you uh, uh, take the expectation value of the total spin out uh, respect to ground state, there is zero. So there is no magnetic order. So, so your, your spin rotation symmetry is not broken. Um, and also, generally, we, we say we are talking about correlated insulator with no broken translational symmetry. And that's the reason why it's called the liquid. So there was this old idea uh, by Phil Anderson uh, basically, his idea was, since we want to have this quantum paramagnet, why don't we start from uh, basically a spin zero object to begin with? So it's, imagine that I have uh, some kind of valence bond between two spin, two nearby spin. So if they are interacting in terms of antiferromagnetic exchange coupling, it's very natural to have a up-down spin configuration. But by making this spin single configuration, uh, I'm, I'm basically starting with a spin zero object. So I'm going to put this spin zero object on the lattice in some arbitrary fashion. And if I just take a one configuration like this, then obviously this state satisfies this criterion, the expectation value of S is zero. But I don't satisfy the other criterion, that I don't want to break translation symmetry. So if I take only one of them, then obviously this will break translation symmetry. But imagine that now I'm thinking about uh, all possible uh, configurations of this balance bond configuration. And imagine that, imagine that I take a linear superposition of all possible configuration like this. Then by definition, by doing so, I'm, I will be recovering a translation symmetry. So I recover translation symmetry. But again, since I, everything makes, made those spin zero object, I will naturally get spin zero state. So this is one way to construct a spin liquid. So here, uh, this is sometimes called radiating valence bond state because uh, uh, this, this valence bond can fluctuate in time, in quantum mechanically, and, and pictorially, this is just a sum over all possible valence bond configuration with some amplitude, a for, uh, some amplitude for each, each valence bond configuration. Okay. So, uh, but there's a cartoon picture. Uh, there's a way to make this discussion a little bit more precise. So you, the, and, and it turns out that it's very useful to start from a superconductor. Um, so you may wonder why, you know, why I want to talk about why, why I want to start from a superconductor when I try to describe an insulator. Then the idea is as, as follows. So this is the famous uh, BCS Hamiltonian. So here, this is called hopping, hopping term. This is the pairing term. And now imagine that. Uh, OK, so then we know that if I do the uh, a field transform, I can write uh, the BCS Hamiltonian like this. We understand the ground state. This is the famous uh, BCS uh, wave function written in a momentum space. And this is famous UK and VK factor. And this is the quasi particle dispersion relation. Um, but now uh, you can uh, transform this Hamiltonian as follows. So you can, uh, you, you can easily convince yourself that you can factor out this UK factor outside the product. So I can rewrite this way. Uh, then, uh, then using the, you know, the remarkable property of the exponential function, I can exponentiate this guy like that. Uh, you, the reason why you can do that is because C, C operators are fermionic operators. And this GK is nothing but the ratio between VK and UK. And then you do the pure transform. Uh, then, okay, so, 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 okay, before I do that, so the product of K, uh, you can put that as a sum of a K in a momentum space like this. Then you do a pure transform. Uh, then you arrive at this wave function, namely that uh, uh, you are pairing uh, the electrons sitting at the position R in R prime. And, and, and they, are, they have spin, spin projection up and down. And this G R minus R prime is nothing but the pair wave function. And this pair wave function is a field transform of this VK divided by UK. So, and, and this is, in fact, the real space form of the BCS wave function. So in the textbook, usually you see this form. 
but this form is basically the equivalent form. So if you, if you think about this species wave function like this, then it's clear that uh, this wave function is not going to conserve the number of uh, electrons because when I expand this exponential function, I'll be generating one pair, two pair, three pair, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is a two particle state, four particle state, six particle state. So the linear superposition of all those, okay? So how can I construct a spin liquid out of this picture? So imagine that I'm starting with a PCS superconductor, and I like to think about a situation where the average number of electrons per side is one, okay? So remember that in superconductor, there's a large char charge fluctuation. So the particles don't have a definite charge state. So charge is not a good quantum number in superconductor. But I can still define an average number, average number of electron, average charge. So average number of electron per side is one. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So now I'm assuming the average number of electron per side is one, but the, the charge of the electron is now well defined in the superconductor. So let's start with, with this uh, real space form of the Bichet wave function. Uh, then I'm going to take the following limit. Then I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to freeze out the charge fluctuation in a superconductor uh, in the following sense. So if I have upspin electrons and downspin electrons sitting at the same position, then uh, the Coulomb, in, Coulomb energy cost will be infinity. So what that means is that if I take this limit, I cannot have a more than one particle per site. But since I already started from average number of electrons per site to be one, if I take this limit, I have no option than placing exactly one particle per site. Do you agree with that? Does it make sense? So average number of particles per site is one. That's, that's the situation I be began with. Now I don't want to have a situation where I have upspin and downspin sitting at the same position. Because the energy cost for that configuration is infinity. Okay. So then I'm forced to have the situation where I have exactly one particle per side. Do you agree? Yeah. So if I do that, that's an insulator, right? Because electrons cannot move. So by starting from a superconductor like this, by taking this limit, infinite repulsion limit, I end up with an insulator. Okay. Now the question is, What's the wave function of such a state? So I started from a BCS wave function. Then P sub Z means I'm doing this projection to a exactly one particle per site situation. So it turns out that if you do so, uh, then the resulting wave function is just the sum of a balance bond configurations where the amplitude of each balance bond is precisely given by product of a Cooper pair wave function. So you can think of that as an explicit construction of uh, wave function of the superconductor, sorry, the spin liquid. Okay. So another uh, way to see uh, the topological nature of this state is as follows. So now imagine that I take a superconductor, say two-dimensional superconductor, and I put them on the surface of the cylinder. So, so, so I, 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 wrap, I wrap around the cylinder. Then imagine that I thread HC divided by three vortex in the center of the center of the cylinder. So I have a I have a, you know vortex threading in the center of the cylinder now, right? So then uh, because of the fact that I now have a vortex in the center of the cylinder, when I go around this when I go around this uh, uh, cylinder along the circumference direction, then my electron basically pick up the phase vector pi, and because of that, if I look at now. Uh, the corresponding Cooper pair wave function. This wave function is periodic in the in 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 x direction, but it's anti-periodic in the y direction because I pick up a phase vector phase vector pi. Okay. So you get some modified um, uh, wave function, and typically, if you do this in a superconducting state, and such a state has a higher energy than the ground state, meaning the 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 state without a flux has a lower energy this guy will have a higher energy. Uh, it turns out, under certain conditions, now if you freeze out the charge fluctuations in both cases, and one case show that if I construct a two state like this, uh, then uh, the energy of this state becomes degenerate in the thermodynamic limit. On the other hand, if you compute the overlap of these two states, the overlap goes to zero. 
So what that means is that these two states uh, generate this way. They are degenerate ground state. Energy is the same, but the overlap is zero. Does it make sense? I have two states on the cylinder. I end up with two states on the cylinder. Energies are the same, but the overlap is zero. So th these are two distinct ground states. Does it make sense to you? Okay. So this is the explicit construction of two degenerate ground state on a cylinder. So if I think about a spin liquid state obtained this way and that way, they are degenerate, uh, but they are distinct state. Of, they, they, are, they are distinct um, um, a ground state because the overlap is zero. Okay. So if you construct this ground state like this, then notice that if I, if I do a, so any local measurement, then no local measurement can distinguish these phases of matter. Because the change is essentially global. Okay. I, hope, I hope it makes sense. You can please ask questions if you have any. Yeah. So it turns out that uh, uh, the, the energy difference goes like e to the minus length of the cylinder. And in fact, that, that's the energy cost to pull this vortex out of the cylinder. Turns out. And obviously, if the cylinder is infinitely long, it takes an infinite amount, you know, it, it, then uh, the, your, your vortex cannot escape, right? So, so that's why the energy cost, energy, energy becomes degenerate. Okay. And, and, and another way of saying the same thing is that now if I look at the content of the wave function, then here I have a valence bond, you know, sum over valence bond covering. It's just that amplitude is now different. In this case, you have to use a periodic boundary condition for both direction. Here, remember that another direction, for another direction, it has to be anti-periodic. Um, so another way to see the same structure is as follows. Imagine that uh, when I talk about, when I think about a superconductor, I take a short coherence length level. So what that means is that I'm thinking about a, a very, very small size Cooper pair. Remember that coherence length in superconductor is essentially the size of the Cooper pair. So if I take a very, very short coherence length limit, what that means is my Cooper pair size is now like one lattice spacing. Does it make sense? Yeah, one lattice spacing. And in this case, that frozen Cooper pair is represented by this, uh, uh, the short line here. And it turns out if you take a, a symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of those wave function that I constructed, and then you can show that in such a state, uh, if I start from some valence bond uh, configuration like this, and, and let's say, imagine that I stick to some, some particular column of the lattice on the cylinder, that if I count the number of valence bonds that cross this line, and if I start with the even number of uh, 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 dimers or valence bonds like this, and you can easily uh, convince yourself that if I, if I want to move this valence bond, then for example, in this case, in this case, uh, sorry. Initially, you cut two bonds, but when, when you move dimers, then it becomes zero. In this case, initially, I had uh, making mistake. Yeah. In this case, I crossed three dimers like this, but I end up with one. My point is, you can only change it here uh, uh, you, you can change the number of uh, valence bond crossing this line only by an even number. So you cannot go from this sector to the other sector. So in that sense, they represent uh, two degenerate ground state. So this is another way to see that there are two degenerate ground state on, on the cylinder. I hope it makes sense. Does it make sense? Yeah. And if you repeat this argument, if you put this system on a torus, then how many ground state do we have? Four, right? Because on the torus, there are two, two holes that I can put a, put a flux, right? Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense at all? Any question? Does it make sense? If you have a torus, if you have a torus, in, so in the, in the cylinder, it's clear that I can flux, I can thread the flux, right? In the center of the cylinder. Does it make sense? Okay. So that's why there are two degenerate grounds there. If you have a torus, then you can trade the flux inside the torus or in the hole of the, the flux, right? 
There are two different ways of threading the flux, right? Each time I generate two degenerate ground state. So on the torus, you will end up with four degenerate ground state, right? Now, if I put this system on a, uh, on a uh, say, some strange manifold of, say, uh, imagine the number of holes is n, then you end up with two to the n number of degenerate ground state. Yeah? yeah. So you cannot do this experiment, but it's like you can do a Gedanke experiment. Yeah, question? Yeah, so here I'm already taking the thermodynamic level. Yeah. So, 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 so that's, uh, uh, that's the manifold without boundary. The torus has no boundary. Yeah. By the side. So, so again, I'm taking a, if you like, I'm taking a thermodynamic, thermodynamic means number of spins, number of spins on the, on the manifold is basically infinity. Yeah, so, so here when I say they, they are degenerate, I'm, only, I'm already talking about a thermodynamic level. Yeah. Okay. So uh, another interesting property of these phases is that the elementary excitations carry non-trivial quantum numbers. So let, let me start with uh, the usual uh, elementary excitation in superconductor. So and in superconductor, Bogolbo quasi particles are the elementary quasi particles. And remember that I started with a, a situation where the average number of particles per side is one. Remember that? Yeah. So in order to have that, I should have a, a particle hole symmetry. Remember that Bogilbo quasi particle is a linear superposition of the electron state and particle state. Remember that? Yeah. And if I have average number of particles per side is one, then I have an equal superposition of particle state and whole state for the Bogolbo Koji particle. That's what I mean by that's what I mean by uh, particle symmetry. So, in that sense, Bogolbo Koji particle has zero average charge, but they carry spin quantum number. Yeah, I hope it makes sense. Yeah, so the equal superposition of particle state and whole state. Therefore, average charge is zero. But remember that in superconductor. You cannot really assign a charge quantum number to your Bogolbo Koji particle because charge is not a good quantum number. But now, if I uh, do the projection, meaning again, um, I remove all the doubly occupied side on the lattice, then I become, you know, basically my state becomes an insulator, and insulator charge is well defined. Now charge is a good quantum number. So you can ask, uh, what happens to this Bogolbo Koji particle after that projection? So since I started the zero average charge, it, it, it makes perfect sense to, to think that uh, the, 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 the charge, charge of this particle becomes essentially zero. But now it's, now it's exactly zero, because I'm in an insulator. I'm not in a superconductor anymore. Yeah? So that way, I can get rid of the charge, but I still keep the spin quantum number. So such a particle will have spin half, but no charge. So that's the way that you can create a charge in neutral object with a spin half quantum number. And these particles are called spin on. So you can think of that as a fractionalization of electrons. But what really happens is that you just, you just screen out all the charge degree of freedom from the Bohlberg quasi particle. So you end up with a non trivial uh, excitation, non trivial excitations. So you see that, you see the analogy between quantum hole state and the spin liquid. I can have a non-trivial ground state degeneracy or a non-trivial manifold. I can also have non-trivial excitations that carry only uh, some fraction of the uh, quantum numbers of the electrons, right? Okay. So some properties of spin liquid are very, very similar to quantum hole state. So in the literature, there is the different kinds of topological phases uh, uh, discussed. So this is what we call uh, symmetry protected topological phase of matter. So again, the argument is very similar. So I want to think about a possible phase transition between some simple phases of matter, say, say, say simple phases means metals and band insulators, to some, topo some topological phase of matter. But now, uh, I want to put a one more condition that when I'm thinking about changing from one phase to the other, 
Uh, so I'm thinking about some, make, some performing a unitary transformation starting from this place to the other. But if I insist that there's certain symmetry uh, in this process, there's some symmet symmetry is in place, so that when I do a unitary transformation, I have to obey that symmetry. Okay? So symmetry cannot be changed when I try to do a unitary transformation from this space to the other. So if you insist that this transformation also does satisfy certain symmetries, then basically there is no uh, uh, transformation you can connect to phases of matter. But if you're willing to break the symmetry, so, so in this plane, so to speak, the symmetry is preserved. But out of that plane, symmetry is not preserved. So I can definitely go from this phase to the other by going through some path or unitary transformation that breaks symmetry. Then it's OK. Then you can connect these two phases of matter. And, and famous example of that is a topological band insulator that, that, that you are familiar with. And here, the symmetry is nothing but a tiny universal symmetry. So if you think about this as a band insulator, this guy is a topological insulator. And if you try to connect them by preserving the time of symmetry, then you cannot connect these two phases of matter. But if you're willing to break time of symmetry along the way, then you can, in principle, connect these two phases of matter. It's OK. You can adiabatically change band insulator to topological insulator once you break time of symmetry along the way. So in that sense, this topological phase is symmetry protected. And this is somewhat different from the previous case. In the previous case, you don't require any symmetry at all. Okay. So in practice, okay. So in practice, uh, this is the typical way to distinguish a trivial band insulator and topological band insulator. So this is the say uh, um, the valence band and conduction band. Um, then uh, this, this band structure represents the surface band structure. So these are the bulk band. These are the surface band. And if you look at uh, what we call a time reversal in momentum, so where, what, where, at, at this momentum position, um, under time reversal symmetry uh, transformation, the momentum goes to minus k up to uh, reciprocal R spectrum. And at that momentum positions, we know that uh, you should have at least uh, a double degeneracy because of time reversal symmetry. So there are two degenerate state here, two gen degenerate state here. They are so-called Kramer's partners. And, and some other, at some other momentum position, uh, these electronic states are also degenerate, uh, meaning they, they should be also, uh, so each, each band is doubly degenerate here. Now, you have to connect this point to the other point uh, by some band structure. And there are two different ways that you could connect. For example, here, uh, when, when I go from this side to the other, uh, you can split this Kramer's uh, uh, degenerate state, but then you can combine the same, same pair here. But you could switch the partner. For example, you can use one of them here, the other guy here. Then you can make a, 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 a degenerate state there, there. So there are two different ways, to, ways of um, connecting the uh, electronic state, boundary state. Uh, but notice that in this case, I, I necessarily have to cross even number of uh, uh, band crossing here. Here, I can have, say, odd number of band crossing. So if I move around uh, the chemical potential, here I can, get rid, I can get rid of the surface state. But here, no matter what I do, I cannot get rid of the boundary state. And, 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 and this kind of situation corresponds to so-called topological band insulator. And that situation corresponds to trivial band insulator. And this is, this is this is distinguished by looking at the uh, surface uh, band structure, but you can also look at the, uh, uh, the bulk, uh, bulk state, especially when your system has an inversion symmetry. Uh, you can, you can uh, label each block state at time versus invariant momentum in terms of parity eigenvalue, so because parity is, parity is a good symmetry. So if you take a, a four independent time versus invariant momentum position, then think about a block wave function. And there should be an eigenstate of parity operator. So there's the parity eigenvalue. There's plus minus 1. So it turns out that if you multiply all the parity eigenvalues here, if the answer is minus 1, then it corresponds to this situation. If, if the product of all parity is plus 1, then it corresponds to that situation. So you can make a connection 
between some kind of um, bulk topological invariant and, and, and the surface state, boundary state. Okay. And you can generalize that to three dimension. So here's a demonstration that uh, if, you're, if, if you're willing to break symmetry, then you can connect two different phases of matter. So, so the question is, how, to, how can you connect band insulator and topological insulator? So imagine that I start with the sum Hamiltonian here. This gamma is some four by four matrices. It's called, it's called uh, a gamma matrices. And they anti-commute. So if you have a Hamiltonian like this, so Ki is some momentum. Uh, let's think about a, a three-dimensional system so that I can have Kx, Ky, and Kz. So if m equals zero, then I just end up with a Dirac fermion Hamiltonian. But depending on the sign of the mass term I put here, um, I can go from band insulator, band insulator to topological insulator. So it turns out that uh, by changing the mass, mass of the uh, Dirac, sign of the mass of the Dirac fermion, I can go from uh, uh, band insulator to uh, topological insulator. But notice that the transition happens when m equals zero. That's essentially a gap list point. So that's, that's, when I, that's what I mean by saying that if, you, if I want to connect band insulator and topological insulator by insisting that perimeter symmetry is always satisfied, then there's no other way. You have to go through the uh, m equals zero point, mass equals zero point. On the other hand, um, if you um, are willing to uh, break time with the symmetry along the way, so here, for example, by multiplying these matrices, one can show that this combination breaks time with the symmetry. So if I add this term here, then this entire Hamiltonian breaks time with the symmetry. But since all these matrices are anti-committing, uh, uh, the spectrum of this Hamilton is always gap, and I can basically go from uh, M equals negative M state to positive M state without closing the gap. But you can do that only when I'm breaking a tiny muscle symmetry. So this is an explicit demonstration of that idea of um, uh, symmetric protective topological phase of matter. Okay. So, uh, okay, so this is the idea, but then the question is, uh, where can you possibly find any of these phases of matter? So I'm going to use this uh, idea of quantum material strong spin over coupling. So just to motivate this discussion, uh, this is essentially the situation that uh, we, are, we are thinking about. So I have, there, there's some band structure. Uh, there's an interaction between electrons. Then imagine that I also have some kind of atomic spin over coupling. So uh, for example, when there is no spin over coupling, uh, when I change the interaction strengths, uh, say, say with respect to the bandwidth or the hoping, hoping strength T, we know that you can have a transition from the simple metal or band insulator to a mod insulator. This is the correlated insulator. Uh, if you, if you uh, have a very weak interaction, and if I only have a spin orbit coupling, then we learn from various examples that I can go, f go from simple metal band insulator to, uh, uh, say, topological insulator or the, or the semi metal. So many of the, uh, say, topological insulators discovered uh, in nature basically belongs to this category. I just increase the spin orbit coupling, then I end up with some kind of band inversion, and, and I get into a topological insulator. So now the question is, <clears throat> what happens if I have both interaction and, 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 and spin, spin orbit coupling? So then, uh, so, so you end up with this kind of phase diagram, and you realize that there's a very large area here where both interaction and spin orbit coupling may be large. And this is the place where we, we, may, we may expect to see uh, interesting phase of matter, in the sense that you have um, um, some interesting band topology coming from spin orbit coupling. But at the same time, your inter interaction between electrons is very, very strong. So that you may expect that you, you may discover uh, different kinds of phases other than just ordinary topological insulators. So that's basically the idea. So, so, uh, so it has been proposed by many people that uh, perhaps 4D or 5D attenuation metal oxides are a good place to start. And, and, and so a lot of uh, uh, interest now in a, a 4D or 5D attenuation metal oxide system. So here's one famous example. So, so many of these materials have this iridium ion. So imagine that I have iridium four plus ion. 
uh, then this guy has uh, uh, five electrons in five d orbital. So if you if you uh, remember your uh, freshman chemistry, uh, of course, if there is no uh, crystal, then this d orbital d orbital states all degenerate. Remember that there are ten state. Uh, there are five d orbitals. Then uh, that's spin projection. So there are basically a uh, ten state there. Then uh, but when, you, when these iridium ions are surrounded by oxygen octahedra, uh, then <clears throat> your 5D, the d orbital manifold split into uh, T2G and EG, EG, EG level. And the reason why it does that is very simple, just be because of the um, static Coulomb interaction. So these orbitals are basically in, a low, in the lower energy state. Uh, but now, if you, um, uh, yeah, but now if you think about the angular momentum operator, of course, for d orbital, angular momentum is two. But if you only think, if you only think about a, a lower manifold here, lower T2G manifold, then by looking at the matrix element of the angular momentum operator, you can easily see that if I only take those guys, then they look exactly like a, exactly like a angular momentum of the p orbital at equal one state, but the sign is opposite. Right? Sign is opposite. So they actually, if you project this operator to this manifold, they actually act like angular momentum one operator, but there's an additional minus sign. Yeah. So now if I turn on the spin of a coupling, then this angular momentum minus one uh, combined with the spin half quantum number, I can generate a total angular momentum state half and three half. And, <clears throat> and um, they basically split because of the uh, spin of a coupling. And since there are five electrons here, four of them goes to the lower energy state, and the remaining one goes to the, uh, uh, the upper level state. So this guy now carries um, a pseudo, -angular, pseudo total angular momentum half, but essentially it's a half field. And this is the wave function, uh, essentially linear combination of three T2G orbital. So you, you just end up with half field, the pseudo spin half system, and you can do that by using a strong spin orbit coupling. So here's the interesting picture that say, this is an atomic picture, but imagine that I go to a lattice, then these atomic levels become some kind of band. So the entire, uh, the 5 the orbital manifold is split into two pieces. So it's, it's like J effective three half manifold and J effective half manifold. This manifold is totally filled, but this manifold is only half filled. So this situation is very, very similar to say, uh, uh, if you are familiar with it, it's like a cupre uh, system where you have a half field band, effective, effective in, the, in, in the effective one band picture. So now, uh, important thing is that here, now if I apply a Hubbard U, so normally uh, if you have a, a total, you know, the entire uh, uh, band like this, then the bandwidth can be very, very large, so it's very hard to make this system to be an insulator, but now notice that the bandwidth around the formal level is relatively narrow, so by, by applying a small Hubbard U, I can split this band to the low Hubbard band and upper Hubbard band. So if I can do that, then even with the small strength of the Hubbard U, um, I can get into an insulator. I can get into an insulator. So, so, so that's one of the reasons why, for example, uh, nobody asked me, asked me this question, but if I go back, to this phase diagram. Notice that the slope, the slope is actually downwards like this. I emphasize that when spin orbit coupling is large, interaction effect is larger. So one reason for that is that using a spin orbit coupling, effectively you can make the bandwidth near the formal level narrow, narrower, and that way the interaction effect can be amplified. So that's, that's, that's one reason why uh, I get this. The reason why this slope is like this is because um, uh, if you have a strong interaction, your band is already very narrow. So even with a small lambda, you can make a big change. So either way, you win. Either, either side, you win. That's why you generate a large area like this. OK. So, um, so as an example, um, I'd like to now discuss uh, this special class of material called particle iridate. So this is the cesium material has this, uh, having this chemical formula. So this is a rare ion. 
So R2 iridium 207. So, so uh, the rare earth iron and iridium, they are sitting at the two interpenetrating paracolarises. So paracolarises is nothing but this uh, corner sharing uh, tetrahedron structure. There are two of those. Uh, they are interpenetrating each other. It's a complex structure, but each one of them sit on an independent paracolaris. So you can put uh, various different kinds of um, rare ions on the R side, or H side, and this is roughly the phase diagram. So by changing the radius of these ions, essentially what you're doing is you're changing the bandwidth of the conduction electron system. So you know, perhaps, how about you, uh, for iridium ions are about the same, but because of the fact that your bandwidth is changing, uh, you can go from a uh, uh, more insulating state to a uh, more metallic state. For example, when you put a presidium here, it turns out that uh, it remains metallic down to very low temperature. On the other hand, if you put a, a say, europium here, then there's a metal insulator transition at finite temperature. Uh, and, it, yeah. and it turns out that this magnetic order uh, is what we call all in, all out magnetic order. So each tetrahedron, if I look at the, uh, uh, the basically moments at corners of the tetrahedron, for this tetrahedron, all moments are out. For this guy, all moments are in. Yeah, so this, this is that's what we call all out, all in magnetic order. It's some kind of anti magnet. But notice that with this uh, magnetic order, the total magnetization is zero. Yeah, total magnetization is zero. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can start with this picture. Uh, then you can construct some very simple tight bonding model out of this uh, J effective half degree of freedom. Then you can put, how about you? Then imagine that I study a phase diagram. So this is the schematic uh, phase diagram you can obtain by doing that kind of exercise. So here is the non-interacting Hamiltonian you can take. So here, my operator C represents the electron in the j effective half basis with up and down spin. So because of the spin orbit coupling, uh, you can have a spin preserving hopping that represented by T1 term, but you can, have, you can also have a spin flip hopping and it turns out that this term is extremely important. <clears throat> and in fact, if you ignore the interaction, just this line is a uh, non-interacting limit. And this, this, uh, this limit of the phase diagram is already interesting. If you uh, change the ratio between, say, uh, spin flip hopping and spin preserving hopping, then you can get either topological insulator or you can get some kind of uh, semi-metallic state. It's called quadratic bending semi-metal. So you can have a transition between, say, metallic state, semi-metallic state, to topological insulator. So even without interaction, question? So could you, could you, uh, could you speak up? Which phase is that? This one? Oh, so non-metal means uh, uh, the temperature, temperature dependence, the resistivity, yeah, the temperature dependence uh, of resistivity is non-metallic. So what that means is that, you know, usually for metal, a resistivity should go down in temperature. It doesn't do that. But, but nonetheless, it's not an insulator. It's a finite temperature, so you can, you, you, know, you can say something is insulator or metal, metallic only, at, only in the zero temperature level, right? So in that sense, it's a non-metal. I think, I think these experimentalists will try to be a little bit more precise. Yeah, okay. So, so you can have um, uh, interesting band topology even without interaction. You can go from topological insulator to a semi-metal. Now, when you, uh, when you increase interaction, it turns out that um, with some uh, intermediate uh, ratio between two, T2 and T1, you can indeed go into all in all magnetic order. So this simple model can actually explain the experimentally discovered magnetic structure. But what is really interesting is that uh, this part of the magnetic, the, 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 the correct magnetic order uh, is actually in a, uh, this side of the phase diagram. Basically, you have to start from a semi-metallic band structure. 
then you, you, then you go into an antiferon magnet. And it turns out uh, you cannot just directly go from this semi-metallic state to an uh, antiferromagnetic state. You actually have to go through some other intermediate phase. And that phase is the famous uh, vile semi-metal phase. And this is what I'm going to explain. And unfortunately, the real material is not here. It's here, or maybe fortunately, because this part is also interesting. But this part of the phase diagram is not realized yet. But it will be interesting if there is a way to get there by changing some parameters of the model. But most of the materials are here in this part of the phase diagram. So here is what happens. So uh, this is some, some result using a very simple-minded Hartree-Fock calculation. So without interaction, uh, uh, in, in, in this part of the phase diagram, in this part of the phase diagram, I have what we call a quadratic band touching semi-error. So remember that on the particle there are four sites per unit cell. So there should be eight bands, including spin. So without magnetic order, each band is doubly degenerate. And then I end up with this band structure. So at, if you look at the Jones Center, this is the chemical potential. You end up with this quadratic band touching. And if you go to the other side here, then the band structure looks like this. So, so why there is a difference like that? So, so group theory tells you that uh, uh, with, this, with, the, with the cubic symmetry of the crystal, if I'm sitting at the gamma point, the Jones center, then group theory can only tell you the band degeneracy. So it turns out that band degeneracy has to be some combination of um, two for two. So here, band degeneracy is like two for two, right? But here, band degeneracy is four to two. The group state doesn't tell you which one should be realized. It only tells you what multiples are possible. So both configurations are possible. But now, if I have this situation, 4 to 2, for the half field situation, I end up with a band insulator. But here, since I have 2, 4, 2, I should have a semi-metal. That's essentially what happens. Right? And there's some kind of band inversion when you go from here to here. And, and interestingly, you don't get a boring band insulator, you, you actually get a topological insulator. But now, if you uh, uh, get into a magnetically ordered state, then your tiny muscle symmetry is broken. So there's now no reason to have, a, have a, a degenerate, a de two degenerate bands, so bands split. But it's split in such a way that I, end up, I, I generate a band crossing along, along gamma and L line, like that. And in fact, it shows only one crossing point here, it turns out that actually there's another crossing point. And these two crossing points, they all, they all move to the L point, and at some point they annihilate, they open up the band gap, you end up with a boring magnetic insulator. So that's the way that the band structure evolves. Um, so essentially what happens is that if you start from this uh, codec band touching, and when you uh, split this band, the simple picture is that each, each uh, codec band touching is split into two pieces like this. So it's very easy to generate a two crossing point. And that's the way that this, this uh, band crossing is generated. Notice that this is the crossing of two non-degenerate bands, right? And that's very important. Um, in fact, uh, in the experiment, this quadratic band touching has been observed in this material. This is the most metallic system. There was an RPS experiment uh, basically confirmed that at high temperature, if you look at the band structure, then in fact the band structure you observe is consistent with uh, uh, this one. Yeah, this guy. Okay, so there's a very simple way to understand this entire picture, and that's using uh, what we call Latinger model. So this is nothing but expanding your band structure around the Jones Center. It's a KDP perturbation theory. So you just expand it of the quadratic order. And remembering that this is a cubic crystal, I have uh, some linear combination, cubic harmonics. And that's essentially the Latinger model. And if you use that, then you can easily explain why uh, th there could be a, a quadratic band touching. And in fact, when you, uh, when you apply a, a time universal symmetry breaking perturbation, you just split that quadratic band touching, you generate a vial formulas. Okay. So one of the reasons why this state is interesting 
is that you can actually detect it by doing all sorts of experiments. So, uh, as I said, these five fermions are actually, uh, they occur always in pairs. And, and they are related, for example, in this case, these two bile, po bile points are related by inversion. <clears throat> so there are, there, you, you always create those points by pair, and it's characterized by so-called this chirality. So if you compute uh, this triple product, uh, uh, triple scalar product of this, this combination for that point, that point, then they carry plus one and minus one. Yeah. And, and this, once you get into this phase, this, this, this phase of matter is extremely stable because especially in three dimension, uh, you can associate uh, each velocity to uh, one power matrix. Uh, the reason why you want to use the power matrix to describe this band crossing is because this represents the uh, crossing of two non-degenerate band. So the, the really there's only two state to uh, take into account. So for each velocity component, if we x, I can associate that with the polymetric sigma x, vy, sigma y, vz, sigma z. But by the time you do that, then there's no other anti-commuting two by two matrix you can add. So it tells you that there's no, you, I cannot gap it out. There's no, there's no mass term I can add to this Hamiltonian. So that's why once you create such a state, it's extremely, extremely stable. <clears throat> so this kind of state has a very interesting property. So for example, imagine that I'm thinking about a, um, some kind of a projection of these five points to a surface Brillouin zone. And, so, and then let's imagine that I'm thinking about, in a bulk Brillouin zone, I'm thinking about some, some uh, cross-section like this. So this is a two-dimensional cross-section momentum space. And if you compute the churn number that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, then it turns out that uh, they actually form an integer quantum mole state. So if you only take a one, one uh, 2D cut of the 3 dimensional brilliant zone like that, so between these two points, and they, this hypothetical 2D system acts like an integer quantum mole state. So what that means is that if I go to the boundary of the 1D system, boundary of 2D system like that, but in the boundary brilliant zone, I should get at least one gapless point because we know that for 2D quantum mole state, there should be an edge state. The edge state is gapless. So should, there should be at least one momentum position where the gap vanishes, right? And you can do that for the next layer, next layer. But by the time you, you leave this thing, meaning you go outside this space between these two points, it turns out that this state is trivial. It's not an integer quantum mole state anymore. So those guys, they don't have any, any edge state. So notice that if I do this, then I generate a continuous set of boundary state like this. But this guy should end here. He cannot continue. So that's, so that's why you end up with this, what people call a Fermi arc state. It looks very strange, but, but that's basically the origin. It can be explained by an uh, integer quantum mole effect, essentially. Yeah, so here, the only thing you care about is the churn number. So churn number, basically some bands can carry a churn number without magnetic field. You don't need a magnetic field to get a finite churn number. And you, have, you just need the, you just, basically this is the property of the wave function, right? Remember that? Property of wave function? So the wave function defined on the 2D plane in the momentum space. If you compute the churn number, that turns out to be one, integer number, one. Yeah, it's the same, same as the new equal one state. Okay. So, so if you only look at the one surface like this, then, then of course you get only one formula. It turns out that if you look at, uh, say, you know, but you can have a, a, uh, another, another boundary on the other side. So <clears throat> if you like, the missing half is actually in the other side, um, the, the other side of the surface state. And notice that this is, this is reminiscent of the situation where uh, when you have uh, integer quantum mole state, remember that? You can have a right moves and left moves, they are physically separated. Yeah? Physically separated. And that's the reason why you could realize some anomalous 1D state. 
This is the same. You know, if you combine these two, you just get an ordinary, you know, closed, closed um, uh, zero energy contour. But, but because of the fact that bulk is of a very strange state, you can separate this, 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 this guy into two pieces like that. So, uh, yeah. So there's some, there's certain um, a similarity uh, in physics. Okay. So, um, so. So even though uh, this fire same metal phase was first proposed in a particle iridate, it was not observed here so far. But it was observed in, observed in other materials. And most of the materials that we know where the fire same metal is observed is actually a semiconductor system where you actually break inversion, not tiny with symmetry. So here, this is an example where you go into a magnetically ordered state so that you actually you actually break tiny vessel, but no inversion. But in a semiconductor system, there is no interaction, really. So you cannot realize a magnetic order, right? So the only way to get that is to break the inversion symmetry. So it turns out that there are two different ways to generate a wire fermion, either breaking, either you break tiny vessel, or you can also break um, uh, inversion. And most of the examples, uh, say, publishing Nature and Science, so inversion breaking a uh, wire semi metal. You, you keep seeing them, right, in the archive. I think there was a time that every week there was a paper. Yeah? But most of them are breaking inversion, not time inversion. So, so for a long time, we thought that particle lead is an example where you could see uh, time muscle breaking fire same error by going into a magnetic loaded state. It didn't happen here, but there is a recent example of, of that. Basically, this is a manganese street tin uh, here. Manganese ions are sitting on a carbonyl lattice. They make a 120 degree order. So you get into a magnetic order state. So it turns out that you know, this is an itinerant magnet. Uh, so, so this is a magnetic order. And it turns out that this material actually uh, realizes uh, the magnetic uh, vial semi metal. So basically, you, you have a magnetic order, so you break tiny vessel. And then you get into this vial semi metal state. Okay. So uh, another interesting property of this fire semi metal uh, is that, in principle, you can have uh, what we call an anomalous hole effect. So again, if you, use, if you use this idea that if I think about a you know, 2D plane for each cut, they act like an integer quantum hole state. So each one of them should contribute a uh, whole conductivity of E square of H, right? Each, 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 each 2D plane should contribute like E square of H whole conductivity. Now, uh, the, you, can, you can say that the number of 2D plane like that should be proportional to 2 times k, the distance between two wire points. Make sense? So each, each 2D plane carries, uh, maybe I should show this picture. You know? So each, each 2D plane carries E square of H whole conductivity. Yeah, I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah. So each plane contributes E square of H whole conductivity. Then I have, um, you know, many of them. The number of um, uh, 2D plane that contribute to whole conductivity will be proportional to the distance between two file points, right? Make sense? So the total whole conductivity has to be proportional to the distance between two uh, uh, file points. Yeah. So I think I'm going to, yeah. I don't think I have time, so uh, let me see. Maybe I should skip this. Yeah. So, in principle, you can have a very large hole conductivity, but in a cubic system like a particle iridate, there are actually uh, many other pairs of file points, and they actually contribute uh, some negative negative contribution. So, cubic symmetry enforces that if you sum them up, the answer is zero. So, unfortunately. If you have a strictly cubic system, uh, then um, you don't get an anomalous hole effect. In fact, in the real system, there are 24 file points. And, and if you sum them up, then whole anomalous hole conductivity is zero. Um, but you can imagine that you, you, you break a cubic symmetry, for example, by making a film or you apply a strain. So then, you, then uh, all these contribution of five point they don't cancel. 
And in principle, then, you can generate a finite uh, enormous Hall effect. And in fact, uh, that has been done. So I'm, I just want to show the, the experiment. So. So there is a, uh, it's a very recent uh, experiment uh, done in the University of Tokyo. Uh, basically, they make uh, epitaxial thin films of uh, pristine iridium oxide. And they found that uh, at very high temperature, like uh, 20 Kelvin, I think, they start to see, uh, they start to see uh, a large animal hole signal. And, and, and you know, Independent, independent of detail, the reason why you could get that is basically because you're breaking a cubic symmetry. So I just want to say that effect like this, it actually has been seen by making a film. Okay, so I think I wanna, uh, yeah, I think I wanna end my talk today like that. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>